Are you an established small business owner or aspiring entrepreneur? Would you like professional advice to help your business grow and succeed? Well, look no further. The Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center is the territory's number one resource to move your business forward. Enjoy no-cost advising, low-cost training, and technical assistance from experts in both the public and private sectors. The VISBDC is nationally accredited and sustained by the University of the Virgin Islands and the U.S. Small Business Administration. Visit us at our locations on St. Thomas, St. John, or St. Croix, and follow us on social media at VISBDC. For easy access to all our training and networking events, be sure to join our newsletter and download the VISBDC app. The Virgin Islands Small Business Development Center, here to help your business start, grow, and succeed. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the VISBDC's U.S. Patent and Trademark Office Series. This session is entitled, Filing a Provisional or Non-Provisional Utility Patent Application. Today's webinar will address important considerations when filing a U.S. patent application, including both provisional and non-provisional type utility application. Allow me to introduce today's lead presenter, Mr. Bobby Rushing, Jr. Bobby Rushing Jr. is a primary patent examiner in Technology Center 3600, examining patent applications involving gear-driven systems, automobile transmissions, and robot arm and joints. While at the USPTO, Bobby has immersed himself in community service, reaching out to elementary school students with RESET, raising excitement for science, engineering, and technology, and kids and chemistry, as well as engineering students with NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers. Here's a friendly reminder to put your question, questions in the chat, and they will be addressed by their presenting team either directly in the chat or later during the question and answer segment. A copy of this presentation will be included in the poor survey email sent after this live event. Please take a few minutes to fill out the survey and let us know how we are doing. And so without further ado, presenter Russian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome everybody um, onto the call today. I um, hope you get something out of this uh, today. And um, just wanted to give a quick, disclaim quick disclaimer that the information henceforth shared by me and those presented, I mean, those on the screen in the, in the presentations are not to be considered as legal advice. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on. Why is this sitting up here? Let's move that out the way. All right, so again, we are from the United States Patent and Trademark Office, also known as the USPTO or firmly the PTO. All right, so again, today we're gonna to be talking about filing a provisional or non-provisional utility patent application. First of all, what is a utility application? Well, a lot of people don't, don't, don't know that there are different types of patent patent applications. You have design patents, okay? The, that deals with the ornamental look and shape of things, like the shape of a cup, um, the front of your refrigerator, the, the front and rear ends of your car, the, the um, what is it? The dashboard of your of your vehicle, the, those are all can can be considered certain jewelry can 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 have design patents. I saw one of my my daughter's bracelets. She has a bracelet by what Annie, I forget the name of the company, but they have so I I I looked it up, looked up the company. I'm a nerd. I looked up the the company and, sh and certainly they have different design patents for their for their jewelry. Um also, we have plant patents, um, which which deals with certain types of plants. But a utility patent is the most is 
when, when folks talk about patents, a utility patent is, is what folks are mainly talking about. Th those are things that have a function and, and have a use, okay? So today's objectives, we're going to talk about the contents of a patent application, uh, including detailed description, drawing, abstracts, and claims. We're going to talk about enablement requirements, limitations of the claims, and how important it is to capture the invention using clear and concise language. Okay, so this is this is one on, on, on the screen to your right. That's what we call the snowball patent. So that is a utility patent. So it was once before a utility application. So on the left side, we're going to talk about the difference between a provisional and a non-provisional application. Okay, so a provisional application is an application that is not that's neither examined nor published. Okay, um, quickly, a non-provisional is published. Um, typically after what, uh, 18 months. And unless the, the um, inventor has some kind of secrecy or something that, that, that they want, that they don't want put out before it, it gets patented, then, then that person may, may opt to, to not have it published. Anywho, um, a provisional, back, back to provisional, is neither examined nor published. It has a one year time time limit and it's only for utility patents okay so during that that one year that that gives the the inventor or inventors time to time to perfect the application they can you know fill fill in what they need as far as the drawings um they, they can also seek um funding um you know if if you watch the show shark tank okay you you'll always hear one person ask do you have a patent? So, so that that shark wants to make sure that 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 they are investing in something that that has the intellectual property ha has been uh, protected. Okay. So, and now now down to provisional, those are examines. That's what I do for a living. Okay. Um, it does require claims. It requires a written description. And um, and the written description must meet certain requirements. Again, it is published eighteen months from the earliest filing date. Um, but it, but again, it, the inventor can request for non-publication, um, and it can become a patent. It doesn't always, but it can become a patent. Provisional patent application. The law requires a clear, ind clear indication that the applicant is filing a provisional application. It uh, it has a fee. It the provisional application has a real, I can't, I, I can't say small fee, but it is a, the, the fee is less than $100. At last check, it was $65 or so. So it's, 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 it's very um, um, inexpensive. Um, the law also requires a description of the invention that, that must enable someone to make and use the invention. Um, drawings, if necessary. Provisional applications continue. It must have a, a cover sheet that provides a clear indication that the applicant is filing a provisional that, that includes the inventor's inventor or inventor's names, the residences, the title of the invention, the uh, correspondence address, attorney information, if any, and any government interest, if any. Provisional versus non-provisional. Um, a provisional application is automatically abandoned after one year. It does not require claims, but it does require a, a written disclosure that must meet the same requirements as the non-provisional. And we'll get to that shortly. No non-provisional applications are not allowed for design patent applications. So as stated earlier, provisional applications are only for utility patent applications. Non-provisional applications must have at least one claim. The written description must meet the requirements of certain legal paragraphs, 35 U.S.C. 112, first and second paragraph. And the non-provisional application is examined for patent, patentability. And again, it can, uh, it's possible to uh, result in a patent. So a non-provisional utility patent application filing guide. A non-provisional utility patent application must, again, include a specification, including a description and a set of claims, at least one claim, 
drawings when necessary. See, since I deal with gears and how gears work and shafts and different things, drawings are necessary. They must be necessary in, in, in order for folks like me to understand what's going on within the claims. And oath of declaration and and the prescribed filing, search, and examination fees. There are online guides. Um, they can have links there. And when you get your copy of this app, I mean of this presentation, you can click to, to see what the guides and the file wrappers um, are all about. The anatomy of a patent. Now, basically, we're talking about the anatomy of the front page of a patent right, right now. Um, on the left, you see another type of patent, another patent that is, but this this isn't. Is it is it real? I'm going to ask a quick question. Who can tell me why this patent isn't real? Can they unmute? Or you can type it in in the in the chat. No answer. Okay, you can tell this patent isn't real because look at the issue date, January first, twenty thirty eight. That is well beyond. <laughs> now we that's um what almost 14 years from now. Um so again on the on the left side you have different pieces. You have the uh the issue date, the issue title, the name of the in, in, inventor. Um it, it, it shows up twice, uh your name where it says your name, and then at the top, the, the first named person is is gonna have their last name uh shown. Uh maybe last name and first name if it's just and individual um, inventor. The filing date, the prior art, the, the one, at least one drawing, but one or two drawings, mainly one drawing, and an abstract. Look at the abstract. The abstract is going to be key um, shortly. So on the on the left side, the, the abstract is a short summary of the invention. There's only one paragraph, and, and it's even limited to how many words it, it can be. A written description that's on the inside of the patent, or basically after after the front page, after the drawings. Um, how does it work? How is it made? How how is it to be used? The drawings. What does it look like? How does it function? You know, I need to 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 see how these gears mesh, or you know how the how the engine connects to the transmission, such and such and so forth. Okay. Now the claims. The claims is what the patent is all about. OK, so the claims define the legal boundaries of the invention, similar to a deed of a property. OK, so so the deed of, of your property, the, the deed sets out where the four corners, if it has four corners of of your properties, of, of your property lies. So the claim set, sets forth what the legal boundaries are for that invention. Specification is the written description of the invention. Again, it talks about how to make and use the invention. It must have clear, full, concise, and exact terms to allow any person skilled within the art, within the technology, to make and use the invention. At least one specific embodiment. You can have different embodiments. Um, and concludes with at least one claim. The claim must begin on a new page. The page format. Okay, this is this is this is boring stuff, but. You remember when you were in high school and college and you wrote your um, your term papers, the teacher said it must be double space, you know, typed, not handwritten. Um, it must have a certain font size. It must have the borders must be at least this much or no more than, than, than this much of a border. That's that's what this page is basically saying. There are certain sections of the, of the specification. You have the title. The most common sections include the background, a brief summary of the invention. If you have drawings, you must have a brief summary, brief description of the drawings. It just says figure one shows a plan view of the invention. Figure two shows um, a cut, cut out section taken from figure one, so on and so forth. And then the detailed description of the invention. Again, the claims are on a separate sheet. The abstract, as I say, uh, as I previously said, are less than 150 words, one paragraph, 
on a separate sheet. When they take that pat that abstract, and if it becomes a patent, well, well, whether or not it'll it'll put it on the um, on the pre grant publication, and then if it becomes a patent, it'll be be on the patent as well on that front page. The title of the invention should be short and specific, but not too broad. I I I, I get some applications where the title says gear. No, give me a more give me a more descriptive title. Okay. Lesser use sections. Okay. Um, let me see. We're gonna look at cross references to different uh, related applications. Mo most large companies they'll they'll they will um, apply to hundreds of of applications, uh, mostly dealing with the the same stuff. But the um, like a a car a car manufacturer may may file patents dealing with the wheel shaft, okay, but you got the gears to the wheel shaft, then the shaft itself, and then the 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 controlling software to 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 control the speed of the wheel coming from the transmission, so on and so forth. So in in that case, you know, you can you can have different cross-referencing uh, items on the in, in the application. Also include statement regarding federally sponsored research. If you work for a um, or if you're doing something for a for a college university or, or some type of grant, um, also names of parties to a joint research project, so on and so on and so forth. The brief summary of the invention is just a, a high level of your invention. Again, that's that that's at the beginning of the of the specification. Uh, describe the, the problems you're trying to solve. Describe what your invention does to make it special or different from, from previous uh, inventions and describe what your invention does. Um, brief description of the drawings. Again, if there are drawings, then um, this, this section must include a brief statement of what each picture depicts. Uh, again, as I said, uh, figure one is a front view of the of the invention. Figure two, it is a is an expanded view um, of the elements prior to assembly, so on and so forth. Drawings are part of the scope of the disclosure of the invention and are required if necessary to understand the invention. Um, not every patent gets drawings, but the drawings that, that I look at, one hundred percent of them have have drawings. Uh, must show every feature of the of the uh, invention that that's claimed. So basically, every part that you're claiming must be shown in in the in the in the drawings. And the drawings must contain as many views as necessary to show the invention. Um, at the bottom, it says two acceptable standards, black and white. Those are those are the most common normal type type of drawings. But color color drawings are permitted in design applications. Again, black and white drawings um, with lines and numbers and stuff, not too heavy to 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 permit reproduction or, or copies. Um, the use of reference characters or numbers. Um, each figure must be labeled, figure one, figure two, figure three A, three B, three C, so on and so forth. Um, and avoid using words in figures, just numbers, mostly. The abstract, again, 150 words or less, double space or double space, not a form in a single paragraph. All right, detailed description of the invention. This is this is the 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 the, the meat and potatoes of the um, of the application. Uh, it is is the very important part of the application. It, it it explains the invention and the process of making, using it, and again, full, clear, concise, and exact terms. It focuses on explaining the structures, the processes, or, or the composition of the invention, and and it goes back and forth to the figures um, to explain the different parts uh, that has reference numbers within the uh, figures. The detailed description also provides clear support and antecedent basis for all terms used in the in the in the claims. So, what you mean an antecedent basis? Basically, 
everything that is mentioned within the claims must be mentioned within the within the specification must be mentioned within the detailed description of the of the invention. Otherwise, I write what's known as um, a type of of rejection, stating that this this claim or these claims do not have um, any antecedent basis from the specification. So, so that that needs to be clear up front. So at the bottom half, it says you can, it, it can be helpful to draft your claims first. So by doing so, you can decide on the terminology to use and make sure that that terminology is consistent throughout the specification. You can also figure out which terms need to be defined or explained in more detail within the specification. And the claims can, can make for a checklist to make sure that the detailed description provides clear support for the claims. Specification dues. Okay, so so these are the things that that you will want to do when you're drafting the specification of your application. Describe the invention clearly to allow any person skilled in the art to make and use the invention without undue exper experimentation. Okay, when referencing the drawings, be sure that each reference number is used only for one part, and that each reference number um, shown in the drawings is mentioned in the specification. Provide at least one embodiment. Make sure that there is a brief description of the drawing section. Provide proper antecedent basis and focus on technical features of the invention. So if we have do's, we also have don'ts, or in this, or in this case, cautions. Okay. So you should not use trademarks in the title or to describe the structure. Okay. Velcro, I did. I, I didn't know this until I started working here in back in 1998. But Velcro, we've all heard of Velcro. Velcro is a trademark term. So, so you can't use the term Velcro. You instead have to use the term hook and loop fastener. I actually wrote a rejection. Um, not, not a rejection. I wrote an objection to claims for using Velcro. And I told them to use hook and loop fastener instead. Um, And you cannot use a, a mark, be it a logo or, or brand uh, that you intend to register for a, a, a commercialized product, okay? Now, back up. Now, you can use, you can, no, no. the background of the um, invention section does not need to state how the inventor conceived with the invention. Like, I came up with this idea while jogging or in the shower or after I, after I cut myself while Chopping onions, not necessary. Avoid making claims of possible future success. This invention will sell and make millions or this invention will revolutionize the field. We don't know that. Do not include a detailed description of the figures or refer to the reference characters in the brief description of the drawings. It's just one sentence tops for each figure. Lastly, do not forget to proofread your specification to look for grammatical errors. You would be surprised how many times I, I, I look at applications that have misspelled words, bad grammar, um, and all types of, 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 of other errors um, that, that should not be. All right. Are there any questions? Any questions in the, in, in the chat? Anybody's hands raised? No questions, you may proceed. All right. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Claims. If it is in the claims, it must be in the specification. That's that again, that's that's what we call antecedent basis. Um, because the claims defines the invention and what what aspects are legally enforceable. The claims must conform to the invention as set forth in the remainder of the spec of the specification, and the terms and phrases used in the claims must find clear support and see the basis. That's, again, defines the inventions. Okay, if it's in the claim, it must be in the specification. Okay, that's just saying it um, a, a different way of, of saying and see the basis. Now, here's a, here, here's a sample claim. On the left, you have a... Um, 
a patent. Again, it's not a real patent because you, you can look at the date. Okay. And on the left, you have a, a claim. Claim one defines a chair comprising a seat, a back support attached to the seat, arm supports attached to the seat and the back support, and a base comprising a plurality of legs attached to the seat. Now, I'm going to ask you to play patent, patent examiner. Do you think that that this application now? OK, OK, say that say, say that this is a, a, a patent application. OK, could you look at could you look around your house? Probably the chair you're sitting in now. Could, could you say that that this claim right here is patentable? Yes or no? Type it in the, in the chat. Any answers? Prices are saying no. All right. Good answer. No. All right. So, so we're looking at this at this at, at this claim here. Um. Again, a seat, back support, support arms, and a base. All right. Um. So, we're going to talk about what the claim looks like. All right. So again, the, the form again, you know, just like the previous example I gave with the with the term paper, you have certain um, uh, criteria that your that your uh, claim must have as far as forms go. Okay, each claim is is on a it's on a single each claim is a single sentence begins with a capital letter and ends with a period. Um, you can have three ind independent claims, 20 total claims before excess fees are, are due. Okay. So I've seen I've seen patents with three claims. Three claims. I just I just turned in um a, 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 a case that had three claims, one independent claim, two dependent claims, um, three total. Okay. And I I had one that had 45 claims. Hmm. So so the person that had 45 claims, they paid excess fees because they had more than 20. All right. Um, and the claims must be consecutive, must be numbered one through 20 or one through three, one through 45, what have you. All right. Patent law requirements. A non-provisional application must have at least one claim, particularly pointing out and distinctly defining the application. Some of these things are repetitive just 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 to make sure that everybody gets gets it okay the claim may be written in independent or dependent claim all right so i just mentioned one independent claim and two dependent claim a dependent claim refers to a claim previously set forth and then further limits the claim invention all right so let's go back to this right here okay all right real quick can somebody give me a dependent claim to this chair claim. Anybody, any anybody have any any ideas on how to further improve on this claim? Okay, how to further specify um, this invention? How about this claim two? A chair comprising um, wheels or rollers, a plurality of wheels or rollers connected to the base. How about that? Okay, so that that would be a dependent claim. Let's go back to the definition here. That would be a dependent claim that refers to the to the to claim one and further limits the claim in, in, in the claim invention. So at first we had a regular chair. It didn't have it didn't say it didn't have wheels, but now we're saying it does have wheels. Okay. Um, claims. Okay, so so claims, claim construction between myself, the inventor, the applicant, or so can be a back and forth. Okay, because 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 the the invention doesn't want the um, the claims to be too general. Why? Because it says right there, it's not patentable. You've already said that this claim right here is not patentable because it's it's too plain. It's 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 too general. Even even my my 
claim to adding to it, adding wheels to it is still not, not patentable, right? So, so, so you don't want your claims to be too general, okay? And you don't want it to be too specific either, okay? Because that that doesn't make it valuable, you know? You don't want to say, I mean, well, you you can say that the seat, the back, and the arm supports are made of leather, okay? You can you can specify the the material makeup of, of of those parts. You can say that the base is made of steel, okay? But unless there's 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 something novel to that chair, then that makes it um, not valuable. Okay, so don't be too specific. You want it. You want that 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 just right. Okay, just like golden locks and the and, and the three bears. We don't want it too hot. We don't want it too cold. We want it just right. So before drafting your claims, you want to ask yourself these these questions. What is the invention? What are the pieces? What are the pieces and parts that make up the invention? How do these pieces and parts relate to one another? How, how do they connect? Do you have more than one invention? Are there multiple versions or embodiments of that one invention? Right? Any questions so far? Any more questions? Any hands up? Not at the moment. All right. So thinking strategically, what is it that you that you're hoping to to, to accomplish? Do you do you want to have the broadest, most valid claim possible? Do you want to obtain claims with a variety of scope, but not just at the time of filing, but during but during prosecution? And what that means is between the the inventor and myself, or the inventor's attorney and and myself, or somebody like me, um, we're going to hash out the best set set of claims. Okay, I'm going to say that. This chair is not patentable because there are five million other chairs that look just like this. Okay, so then the the applicant, the inventor, or or, or his attorney, his or her attorney, is going to say, "Okay, Mr. Rushing, you're right. We're going to amend our claims to add these features." And I'm going to say, "Oh, okay." And then I'll I'll, I'll take a look at at the patentability of that amended claim. Okay. Excuse me. Also thinking the, the thinking strategically even further, how much can you afford to spend on claims? Now, it's, uh, it may not be a secret to you, but getting a get, getting a patent, you don't know. No how much can you afford to spend on claims? Independent claims in excess of three is hundred fifteen dollars per claim. Total claims are in, ex in excess of 20 is $25 for claims, okay? But not just at the time of filing, but during prosecution, okay? But note, all of the costs above are for micro entity, okay? So so, so what that means is, is that if you have a small business um, that you can apply for micro entity status and and that way you're, you're paying less fees than say Amazon um, and the other you know large large corporations. Claim drafting. A claim in a utility application or patent has three main parts: the preamble, transitional phrase, and the body. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back. I'm 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 gonna, I'm gonna go back and forth. Here's your 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 first phrase: a chair. Then you got the transitional phrase, comprising, and then the body. The, 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 the rest of the claim is the body. Yep. The preamble, transitional phrase, comprising or consisting of, and the body reciting the elements of the invention. Transitional phrases, comprising versus consisting of. Comprising is, is the most commonly used. It's, it's open-ended. It's open-ended. Um, which means that the claim may comprise everything that that I have here and may and maybe more. Consisting of is close and close ended, which means that the claim elements uh, that follows are limited to 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 just those parts and and nothing else. Okay. All right. So an example claim, another one here. We have a. A shovel comprising, so we say comprising, so it's open-ended, 
which means that it can have things other than those than those parts. So a shovel comprising a handle and a blade having a point thereof. Okay, the shovel is the use my mouse. The shovel is the preamble. Comprising is the transitional phrase. A handle and the blade. That's the body. All right. All right, claim drafting dues, particularly point out and distinctly claim the subject matter regarded as the invention. Consider drafting your claims first. Review, review both to make necessary additions and corrections. Look at the claims and the patents issued um, in your field of technology. If you if you're working on gears, if you're looking on if you're working on what have you, take a look at, at the prior art of 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 your competitor or 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 things that are similar to to, to what you're to what you're um seeking a patent for. Ensure each term has proper antecedent basis. Think about what legal protection you need for your invention. Claim drafting don'ts. Do not use claims covering two statutory classes of invention. Um, not in the in the same claim. You can't say a widget and a method for using. Okay, all right. So stop. Statutory classes de deal with what type of patent it is. Okay, so you have the chair. You have the what 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 was it? The the shovel. You have the chair, the shovel. Those are um, those are apparatus claims. Let's talk, okay? But you also have method claims, methods for making, methods for using, and stuff like that. But you can't say this, but you can't do the same in one claim. You can have, you can have a a chair claim, and you can have a method for making a chair claim. You can have that in the in the possibly possibly have that in the same application, okay? Do not use terms inconsistently between the spec between the claims and the specification. Meaning, don't use visor, visor member, visor section, visor portion. Use the same term throughout the specification, throughout the claims. Do not write multi-sentence claims. Why? Because each claim is its own sentence. Do not refer back to only a portion of another claim, okay? Um, the widget of apparatus of claim one. You gotta, you gotta go back to the entire, um, the chair, Okay, if if you if you want to say, you know, when the chair has a widget, that's fine. But but you got to say the chair which has a widget, so on so on so forth. And do not replace elements from one another, um, from another claim within a dependent claim. You everything has to be consistent within the claims. Any questions? No questions now. Excuse me. All right. Resources. This is one of my favorite parts. All right, let's go. All right. So the Inventors Assistance Center. The Inventors, Inventors Assistance Center provides patent publications and services to the public. The AIC is staffed by former supervisory patent examiners and experienced former primary examiners who ask the general questions concerning patent application policy and procedure. You have the, the days and times, except federal holidays. You have a phone number off, off, off to your right. The pro bono program, this is this is great. The, it's a nationwide network that, is, that assists financially underrepresented independent inventors and small businesses. You can look at the, uh, at the website at the link below, uspto.gov slash pro bono patents, okay? The pro bono is 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 across the is across the country and you can see that there are different regions. Um you may want to ask the SBDC if there is something for um for for the Virgin Islands. Maybe it falls under the Florida region, but I'm not sure. Law school clinics Okay, this is this is a, a a great program. The USPTO Law School Clinic Certification Program allows law students participating in a 
<clears throat> enrolled in a participating law school clinic program to practice before the USPTO under the guidance of a law school uh, facility clinic supervisor. What is the benefit of, of, of that? You have multiple eyes on your, on your application. It is less, it may be, maybe less expensive, okay? And you can still get a patent at the at the at at the end. Uh, the link for that USPTO.gov slash law school clinic. There are several schools, some universities across the country that that participate in the law school clinic. The PTRC uh, patent patent and trademark resource center. There are several of those um, across the nation, and I can see Puerto Rico as well. Um, but you can call them up. I live in Maryland, and I contacted the Howard University PTRC. We set up um, we set up a, a a a virtual meeting, and I had her help me out. Now, now you might ask yourself, why did you ask? You know, go to a a a, a PTRC. Why did you need help? Well, while I'm a patent examiner and I'm an expert at it, okay. I know nothing about trademark searching, okay? So there was something that, there was a trademark or something to deal with trademarks that I wanted to look up. So I contacted the PRC and I asked them for help and she helped me a lot. So, so it's 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 for everybody, contact them. You, you see whether or not, again, yeah, because I contacted the Howard University one. I could have easily contacted one at the University of Maryland, which is right up the street. Um, there are, certain libraries that, that have PTRCs. I've done these presentations for different PTRCs across the country, across the East Coast, uh, from New York State and all, all the way down to Florida, um, as well as the, the, the SBDC uh, as well. I did a couple of those in Florida, Virginia, Pennsylvania. Yeah, all over. Resources, we have a bunch of links here that you can look at. At your, at your, and you can peruse on your own time. And that is it. If you have any any questions for the Eastern Regional Outreach Office, by all means, you have the email there. Uh, my name is Bobby Rushing. You can reach reach me, bobby.rushing at uspto.gov, Eastern Regional Outreach Office at uspto.gov. You have the number there. Um, or you can uh, um, reach out <clears throat> You can find us on uspto.gov. Do a search for regional outreach office or outreach office. All right. I think that's the last page. Thank you very much. Any? Oh, that's not the last page. My bad. So for the um, Virgin Islands SBDC, there's uh, contact information here, the email, website, phone numbers for St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix, um, different social media and YouTube, and so, they even have an, have an app. Yes, sorry to interrupt. We do have a question. Um, sure. Do you have, do you need an attorney to submit an application? You don't. You don't. Um, now, ninety nine percent of 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 patent applications are filed through a um are filed with an attorney, but you can do what's called a pro se application, meaning that 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 a person files his or her own patent application. Okay, um, you just have to be knowledgeable on that. There there are there are groups that that will help you. To uh to 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 find um to 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 file an application, but I would be aware of those um patent submission corporations and 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 I'm saying that generally I'm not naming a specific company or brand or whatever, but I'm saying generally uh beware of companies that say that you know give us your application we'll file it for you. Be wary of that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a question. Sure. During your years at the USPTO, what has been the longest 
time frame in terms of working on an application? Um, okay, so, so I will answer that with, with this caveat. That may depend on how, on how the inventor wants to prosecute their application, okay? Um, now I've, let me see, I believe it's been a couple years, like three years, and I'm, and with that, I mean, we went, I, I filed my rejection. He, he, the, the in, inventor, um, or his, his or her attorney files a response, files and amendments to the claims. So it goes back and forth, back and forth. But after a, after a number of times, it, it could be as as low as two that the applicant can file what's called a um a uh basically what what it is he the inventor what what we call is taking us to 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 the board okay um he wants to the applicant wants to argue against with the patent appeal board that I may be wrong in my in my in my rejection and that he's right so on and so on and so forth but to answer your 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 question personally maybe maybe three years or so of back and forth okay three years um uh, question what are some common mistakes made that can simplify the process um First of all, um, I mentioned earlier, um, grammatical. You know, make sure that your that the that the application has proper grammar, um, uh, spelling, and all that. You know, that makes it easier. Um, again, from the from 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 the presentation, make sure that everything that that's mentioned in the in the specification is. Is in the claims, okay. Make sure that everything that's in the specification is in the drawings. Um, that's basically it, in my opinion. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, well, thank you for that. I don't see any questions um, in the chat at this moment, but if we go back to the previous slide, I'd just like to make mention that the BISPDC has so much more in store. For USBI small businesses, you can check out our website at www.bisbdc.org. Download the BISBDC app on your mobile device from the appropriate app store. Like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google Business. And subscribe to the BISBDC YouTube channel for new uploads of our on-demand webinars. Just um, to give you guys a preview of upcoming trainings, well, thus far on-demand, we have Disaster Resiliency and Financial Preparedness for Small Businesses. SBA with Surety Bonds 101, our Small Business Resilience Series um, with a small business approach to securing federal contracts. Coming up on the 26th, we have our State Director, John Morasco. He's going to be presenting the U.S. Beneficial Ownership Information Registry process, what every small business needs to know. On July 30th, we have our Small Business Resiliency Series returning with the final session entitled Set Your Business Up for Success Hiring and Retaining Quality Employees. And for new startups, we have our business development series on August 6th, and that's going to be starting your business in the USBI. I don't see any more questions, but we do want to thank the USPTO for collaborating with us, the VISBDC, on this initiative. And we thank everyone for attending today's session. And we do wish you a rest, a good, a productive rest of today. So bye, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.